Welcome to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news, trends, and hottest topics that focus on advances in cybersecurity and cyber industry economics. Our expert yet down-to-earth hosts make cybersecurity straightforward. They ask the tough questions and make this challenging topic something that everyone can understand. Our candid approach lets guests open up on topics we would all like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at newcyberfrontier.com. That's www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join today's host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. Welcome to today's episode of New Cyber Frontier. On today we have a special treat, Bryce Austin, who is a published author, a security expert, but his book, Secure Enough, and the good title it says, I think it says it all actually, that hey, we're looking at in our age, inundated with security information, right? Everybody's got an opinion. The only thing we have is experts. They're all selling something different. What's, when's enough enough? What is the, the amount that we can say, all right, we're targeting to make sure we cover this. Bryce, welcome. Thanks for joining today. Thank you for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. Yes, definitely appreciate you being here. Um, kind of give us your background. What led you to the point where you published a book on security? Sure. Uh, the 30-second background is this. Uh, degrees in chemistry. Thought I was going to be a PhD chemist. After two years of grad school, decided I didn't want to be a PhD chemist. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Went into technology because I'd always been in it for fun. Mm -hmm. Got into the payroll space, which is ripe with cybersecurity concerns, and spent a total of 11 years there. Uh, three years for a small company and eight years uh, running technology for the payroll arm of Wells Fargo. Then I went over to Target, running the technology programs that would touch the stores themselves. And that was in 2013, right before the breach. Well, that credit card breach uh, made me one of the 2,000 people laid off in 2014. So they so laid I, off security people when they had a security breach. Well, uh, I, they did lay off some, actually, but I was in technology and cybersecurity leadership at Wells and at the small company Payday of Minnesota. But at Target, I was running the new exciting stuff, the technology programs that would change the customer experience, the team member experience, things like flexible fulfillment is the name of it, but it's okay. buy online at target.com, pick up in a store. How do you integrate those systems? Well, that was one of my teams making it happen. And it was a great place to work in a very exciting time, right up until that 40 million credit card breach in 2013 and 2014. So in the wake of that billion dollar issue, the new shiny technology programs that my team was running just weren't all that important anymore. Mm -hmm. I so that. at that point, I decided to take a, a shift. I decided to change the focus of my career to help other companies not fall victim to the same fate. Mm -hmm. And the way to know whether or not you're secure enough is to be educated about what the risks really are and to understand your company's posture, your company's culture as to what will be secure enough so that you can sleep at night. And that's what I help my clients do. Um, yeah. I act as their quote unquote attorney on retainer disclaimer. I am not an attorney, but I act in their best interest. And I act as a, a fiduciary would if I was uh, selling investments. So we try to work together to understand what their cybersecurity risk is and to get it to a level that they're comfortable with. Gotcha. So who was your target audience for that book? I'm looking for managers, leaders, executives that are educated, that are passionate, and that are not focused on cybersecurity or technology. I'm looking for the COO that knows how to talk to the head of legal and the head of HR and the head of finance and have good, meaningful discussions. And they get to the head of technology or the head of cybersecurity. And it's like men are from Mars, women are from Venus. They don't know how to communicate. So this book is designed to give them the blocking and tackling of the cybersecurity landscape so that they can figure out what is secure enough for them. Interesting. And uh, we're going to take a little break here and hear from our sponsors. Um, but I want when we come back, we're going to expand on that and, and talk about what it is that that base set of skills looks like to that uh, executive. We'll be right back. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. 
Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. Welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. On today with author Bryce Austin of Secure Enough. So before the break, we were talking about how you got to writing this book and uh, who it's towards. You know, it's towards that CEO, that chief of operations, that person that's not technical that might pick this up, say, I'm going to a meeting and I need to read it on a plane. So you, you explained that that was kind of your target. Indeed. Indeed it was. Um, I saw some books in the industry that that were well written, but I don't know of a lot of executives that have hours and hours and hours to spend on something like cybersecurity. So my goal was to write a book where when a person gets on a plane and they close the boarding door, they can open the cover of my book. And by the time they've flown from LAX to O'Hare, from LaGuardia down to Orlando, just a couple hour flight, when they open that boarding door, I want them to be able to close the book and have pretty much been able to read it cover to cover and then go have that meaningful conversation with their head of technology or their head of cybersecurity. That was the goal. And I didn't see a book that met that niche in the industry. So I wrote one. You know, I think that's a great concept is, you know, right now we're telling you, hey, if you're heading to a meeting and you're flying across the country, pick up this book so you can read it on the plane. And when you get there, you know, feel at least able to communicate on the topic. Indeed. Indeed. That would, uh, the name of the company I started is TCE Strategy, which stands for Technology and Cybersecurity Education. And this was the beginning of the E in TCE Strategy. It, it was my attempt to help make a dent in this space. And between that and a lot of professional speaking, it's been very rewarding to, uh, to meet and reach out to as many people as I've been able to through these mediums. Yeah, definitely. So you also do a lot of technology consulting. And we, I, we, we were talking before the, the, the show, uh, and you have some, some relatively interesting new things. I remember that uh, you had, we had talked about the tax service during the COVID and everything, and some of the, uh, the new ransomwares. And I was really interested in that. It sounded, uh, I'd never really heard that. But tell our audience about these these two directions that you've seen lately in ransomware. Absolutely. So for those who aren't familiar with ransomware, a cyber criminal gets into your company and instead of trying to steal credit cards like they did at Target or steal people's personal information like they did at Equifax, they simply encrypt your own information to shut down your operations. They make it so you can't do business and then they extort money from you to give you the decryption key so that you can decrypt your own files. And having been through it with a number of clients, um, it, you aren't likely to get all of your files back. You know, the rigorous error checking that cyber criminals do, that's an opportunity for improvement. So the new variants that I'm seeing are twofold. Um, first, there are some new ransomware groups out that are exfiltrating your data prior to encrypting it. And if your data isn't necessarily valuable, uh, like credit card numbers would be, like the Equifax data would be. Well, it's still valuable to you, and it can cause a lot of embarrassment or regulatory fines or what have you if it gets out. So they are taking your data and storing it, then they're encrypting it. And if you have good ransomware defenses and can recover without paying them, well, they'll start releasing your data online. So now they have a one-two punch trying to get you to pay up. And that, that's new. That's not something that we saw years ago. The other one, and this just happened a few weeks ago, is Honda had a global ransomware attack that took out uh, manufacturing facilities uh, around the world. And the, the actual ransomware that was used did get out, and researchers were commenting on it. It had been tailored. It had been customized so it would only execute when it saw domains that existed inside of Honda's network. So that means two things. First, someone had insider information. Now that's not too terribly uncommon, mm -hmm. but 
someone took the time to make this a smart bomb to where if it got out in the open, it didn't do anything. But if it got into Honda's network, then it executed. And that that's unique. And it shows just how lucrative cybercrime has become and how much time and, and effort that cyber criminals are willing to put in to the payloads that are trying to attack us. Um, it's a scary development. Yeah, that was that was interesting. I had not heard either of those two things as well. Um, and uh thought that you know it might be interesting to, to to explain that i like your new term that the smart bomb um, <laughs> and, and i know you had said that they kind of talked about that back with stuxnet and whatever but it's yes. uh it's definitely a a um a new thought process in what we're worried about but at the same time it's kind of like oh well they weren't after me so i'm actually kind of safe but that's um who they pick and who they're after is a, is an interesting you know part of this it is. It, it, well, it shows two areas. Uh, first, information that you think of as not terribly sensitive, not terribly important, it actually can be. And things like the, the internal domain names of your company, well, those are often very easy to guess, or a lot of contractors have access to it. Your backup operator has access to it. So it's often not that hard to come by. Um, and that was a mistake in Honda's part. Target, to be honest, they made a similar mistake uh, as a lot of other big retailers like Home Depot and all the others that have been, been hacked from a credit card standpoint. See, back in, in financial services where I came from, well, back in the 80s, the financial services companies really had to find religion when it came to protecting the source code for the mainframe. Mm -hmm. Because that, that movie in the late 90s that talked about how someone could take a fraction of a penny from every transaction, office space. Mm -hmm. So that was real. That actually happened in the 80s. Your interest payments in the mainframe didn't go out to two decimal places, to dimes and pennies. It went out to five decimal places. And someone wrote code to try to take the tenths and hundredths and thousandths of a penny from every single transaction, and they made millions. And I really hope the jail time was worth it. Well, the fast forward up to the retail space, the source code of the cash registers is their version of the financial services mainframe. And at the time, it wasn't protected the way it should have been. And that was really a fatal flaw. So what these new ransomware attacks are telling us is that the information we have about how our network works is far more confidential than many people think. And the thought that some network design needs to change every so often just so it changed, so that your former employees don't know what it is anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a bad thing to be doing. And I have a lot of clients that have system accounts that are shared between administrators, and some systems demand that, regrettably, but they don't periodically change those just as a best practice or when a member of the team leaves. And that leaves you with a tremendous open window that someone that decides to turn to the dark side of the force can walk right through. Yeah. And you know what the the pure in the we'll say the cryptologist and security people are taught security by obscurity is no security at all. So the the fact that just changing something actually would not cross the mind as often as a, of a technical person because of that intrinsic training. You bring up a good point. Um, the internet has become this this giant transformation in the concept of security through obscurity because before we had large-scale networks well being off the radar was a pretty good way to not be known mm -hmm. but the internet changes all of it in two ways one every company advertises in some form or fashion on the internet so we now all have a version of the fountains at the bellagio in vegas where if you're on the internet and you want to find out about a company it's pretty easy to do even finding out about individuals is much easier than it used to be. So that's the first issue. The second is that if we had a magic car that could magically go between every house in the world inside of an hour and test the lock to see if the door was unlocked or not, well, a physical criminal would really like to have that car, but it doesn't exist and it never will. In the internet, it's existed for years. You develop a bot or a robot, and it's a piece of computer code that goes around looking at websites, at people's VPNs, and it looks for silly, easy-to-exploit openings. 
And those openings, they get pretty technical. You know what? We don't need to talk about why it's important not to have port 3389 open to the internet, even though that is very important. Mm -hmm. The point is the magic car that can check the locks on your company's network every hour for every company on the planet, that's happening. It's happening right now. So I often tell my clients, you need to think of yourself as a cybersecurity world that is that like a porcupine. You want to be a porcupine in a world of squirrels. Yeah. You're not bulletproof. Let's take a break. You can't guarantee that you aren't going to get hacked, but you're in much better shape than most. So most people are going to look for another squirrel. All right, let's take a break. Hear from our sponsors. We'll be right back to talk about that porcupine a little bit more. Welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. On today, talking with Bryce Austin, the author of Secure Enough. So before the break, we were talking about your company wants to be a porcupine. You want to make it uncomfortable. So if somebody's out hunting for small game, you know, you're not the first one they're going to pick. So explain that. Sure. Expand on that because now everybody's being a porcupine. Well, and that, that, that does make things more challenging. So there are a couple of schools of thought here. Um, if you are a Fortune 1000 or if you are in the financial trading space of any sort, from MoneyGram to a payroll company, this argument falls apart. So I just want to say that up front, that if you are a bank with gold and cash in the back, well, you are a target, period. Mm -hmm. But for 99% of us, that's not the case. Let's talk about individuals. If you are a politician that's well known around the world, you're a big target. If you are a celebrity around the world, you know, it, I, I like Taylor Swift a lot. And the fact she has stalkers and such is very sad, but that's true of all the big celebrities. It doesn't matter which one it is. I just talked about 0.x percent of all companies or all people. It's a tiny, tiny fraction. For the rest of us, they're not looking for us personally. They're not looking for our company specifically. They're looking to make money. Mm -hmm. They want to find a way to grab money that they are not entitled to. They are thieves. They're just common thieves. So for 90x percent of all companies or all individuals out there, this analogy is still very strong. There are lots and lots and lots of people that are not doing a good job with cybersecurity. And there are lots of companies who haven't tried to look at this risk and say, okay, I can understand the risk and accept it. I can mitigate the risk to a lower level where I can accept it, or I can transfer it to someone else via insurance or, or what have you. A lot of companies, they're simply sticking their head in the sand and hoping that nothing bad happens. And that works right up until you get hacked. And, uh, I do a fair amount of incident response and deal with those ransomware cases. Um, it is not how I like to, to make TCE strategy help my clients. I'll, I'll, I'll do it and uh, I enjoy the work. It's exciting to be part of a crisis, but boy, it's a lot more fun keeping them from getting hacked in the first place. Mm -hmm. So what if, I mean, how, your book's been out for two years. As we yep. march forward, have you sampled at all You know how well we're doing? How much are companies moving forward with from the squirrel to the porcupine? And, you know, mm -hmm. at what point does, you know, I'm not the low hanging fruit anymore become, well, everybody has to step it up a notch. It's a very good question. Um, some areas are improving markedly. Uh, laws on the books like GDPR, that's the European Citizen Protection Law, like CCPA, that's the California uh, Privacy Act. Those sorts of things are forcing some companies to take notice where they otherwise wouldn't. There are some regulations uh, like COPPA, which is part of what helps uh, students and colleges and such stay safe. There's HIPAA, which helps healthcare organizations. They're moving the needle forward some. 
the number of companies that have figured out that cybersecurity can be a competitive advantage. Now, those are the ones that are really going to be on the forefront in the years ahead. Uh, I think in this post-COVID world that we're now living in, we have a new understanding of just just how open we can be having people work from home and having these internet of things devices that we're buying are now part of a corporate network. And the initial attack vector in was this weird, obscure deal that you never thought would be a problem. And all of a sudden it's a real problem. That's what happened at Target. It was a company out East, Fazio Mechanical, were trying to put their invoices into the Target system so they could get paid. And somehow their credentials got hacked. Multi-factor authentication was not part of that system, and it should have been. If you don't know what that is, I know a good book you can buy to help. It'll teach you to better be secure enough. <laughs> so not having multi-factor authentication on this invoicing system is what gave the cyber criminals a foothold into the target network. And then they hopped from system to system until they found the source code to the cash registers. Those sorts of things, it's getting better overall in the industry. We still have a long way to go. There's just no question about it. Uh, and the cyber criminals are, are getting better because they're so much better funded yeah. because we have a whole lot of organized crime organizations that have realized if they're in a certain country that doesn't have an MLAT or mutual legal assistance treaty with another country, we'll go after that country. And the odds of your law enforcement caring about it are pretty slim. And that's what's happening right now. Yeah. So uh, one of the advice I give my clients is if you happen to be based in the USA, for example, and you don't have a good business reason to be doing any sort of communication with Russia or China or North Korea or a lot of smaller companies and uh, countries in Africa, just shut off the ability for your company systems to communicate with those countries via email or directly via your network. And you can knock out a lot of the low hanging fruit with that one tip. So that is one way to porcupineify yourself with a very, very small investment of time and effort. And it's, it's a hundred of those little things that can add up mm -hmm. into making you a far, far less uh, attractive target than the company down the street. Interesting. Now, you had mentioned something, though. Uh, you know, your book, Secure Enough, is getting from zero to one, it sounds like almost. But you had mentioned differentiating yourself with security is the wave of the future. What, what do you recommend to get from secure enough to there? Mm -hmm. And, you know, is there a book in store for that process? You know, I, uh, it, we have been talking about, about such things. Uh, the gentleman that, uh, helped, well, he wrote the forward to the book and was one of my key advisors. His name is Cliff Triplett. And we are talking about book number two for companies that manufacture a thing. If that thing has the ability to hop on a network, you making a more secure version of that thing, a more updatable version of that thing is going to bring you a competitive advantage. And it often does not cost a lot of money to do it. Even if you're not in the business of doing that, that thing, I go through a lot of contract reviews with my clients and I help them with proposed language that, that gives both sides of this an interest in cybersecurity. Well, if your company is more able to sign contract language saying that you have some responsibility in keeping your customers secure, and if you hire vendors and are willing to give preference to vendors that are willing to take some responsibility for keeping you more secure, you have a competitive advantage. And it should be part of your marketing materials. It should be part of your training manuals for your customers. It should be the about us section of your website. Saying that you have a cybersecurity posture as a company that you're willing to talk about already puts you in an era where competitive advantage is very real. And it doesn't take that much money to get it off the ground. It's more a question of a thought process that this is one of the ways we can differentiate ourselves. And even, even commodity brokers. Um, I, I work with companies that manufacture plastics. I work with companies that make insecticides. I work with insurance companies, with social services, healthcare companies. Um, one of my largest clients is a biotech company right now, and they're ramping up to make 100,000 COVID test kits per week. So I'm, I'm very excited to be part of that effort, but we're trying to keep the cyber criminals out while we're doing it. And us having a cybersecurity posture that ensures that those 100,000 test kits are going to go out every week on time without exception, well, that in and of itself is a competitive advantage. 
So writing on the books that we have a higher degree of confidence in our pipeline because of our cybersecurity posture, it's a really good way to talk to your investors about why you're so confident in your forecast. You know what this 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 reminds me of is um, the quality kind of push, the quality air in differentiating yourself by quality, because that's really what it is. It's just digital quality. I think there's something to that. Yeah. Yeah. The ability to keep your company out of the hands of cyber criminals keeps your intellectual property safe. That's an obvious competitive advantage. If you can stay up while other companies aren't, that's a competitive advantage. And if you've got a good marketing team, you can turn those sorts of cybersecurity postures that you have into a talking point of your company. I see a lot of companies that advertise strongly that they're made in the USA or whatever country they're trying to sell to. I see a lot of companies talking about how our warranty will outlast the competition, every space available. You know, the, we have uh, people building cars now with a 10-year bumper-to-bumper warranty and a lifetime uh, drivetrain warranty. That's a big change from the 60s and the 70s when we had cars rusting out after two years here in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. These sorts of things aren't a necessary evil. They're a potential competitive advantage. It's just a change in mindset. Yeah, it sounds like that's when you're looking at differentiating yourself with cybersecurity. It's those little competitive advantages that there's hundreds of that, um, you know, in a lot of our traditional We'll say over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, some of the biggest manufacturers have actually differentiated themselves with cybersecurity. And most of the public doesn't know that. Things like the Apple ecosystem, where they can control all the identities of their devices. They can control how many are in what regions of the world. They can control how many their, their contractors make. They can control every software that's put on them, every vendor that writes software. Those are all cybersecurity controls that have made companies like that what they are. I agree. Uh, Apple's a very good example. When they took on the FBI in 2015 over that horrible terrorist attack in California, um, they were taking a stance that to reverse engineer their own products so that they become hackable is opening a door that cannot be closed. There's yeah. no way to undo that. Now, more recently, they've made some decisions around how they encrypt your data in the iCloud and such that I'm not as big a fan of. But in general, they are trying hard to sell privacy and security as a feature set of their product. And you don't have to be Apple to do that. You can be manufacturing things like insecticides and plastics. But if you have language in your contract that talks about your cybersecurity posture and the commitment that you give to your uh, customers as a result of it. When you have a company, like let's stay on the insecticides for a moment. If you're selling to a Home Depot, well, Home Depot had an even bigger breach than Target did about six months later. They may have the record of the highest number of credit cards ever exfiltrated from a company. And because of that, they're very interested in the cybersecurity of you as their potential vendor. So it's something that you can go in with to differentiate yourself. Definitely. So as we're kind of reaching towards the, the close of this, um, let our listeners how, know where they can pick up your book, um, how they can get a hold of you for speaking engagements, for consulting, uh, and things that you do, what type of customers you serve. Hey, thank you so much for the opportunity. I focus on companies between the $50 million and billion dollar space. That's typically where having a, uh, a chief information security officer on retainer makes the most sense. To pick up my book, it's available on Amazon. Either search Bryce Austin or search Secure Enough, and it should be the top hit. It's also available at Barnes & Noble. To find out uh, about my team members or myself helping you, uh, please go to tcestrategy.com for consulting or bryceaustin.com for speaking opportunities. All right, and also on LinkedIn, you're pretty easy to find under Bryce Austin. Indeed. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining today. It's, it's definitely been a pleasure, and I enjoyed speaking with you. Chris, thank you for the opportunity. Take All care. Right. Thank you for listening to New Cyber Frontier. Remember to follow or like our post and circulate each new show to your networks. We keep you informed, bring you the latest news, explore new trends, and find the hottest topics. With New Cyber Frontier, you don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert just get plugged in.
We encourage you to get involved. Tell us what topics interest you and join our mailing lists. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. That's newcyberfrontier.com. Check out our previous interviews and please let us know if there are any topics that you would like to hear discussed. See you next time on New Cyber Frontier.